This is the Begin Within podcast, where we believe real, lasting health and fitness requires you to start inside before you work out. I'm your host, Nate Slegger, and I'm here to show you behind the scenes of fitness. You already know exercise is good for you, but what about all the other things in life that affect your fitness? If you're looking for extra motivation to get started or to make sure you keep going, this is the place for you. Produced by BeginWithin.fit My guest today is Dr. Connie McReynolds. She is a licensed psychologist and certified rehabilitation counselor. She's got more than 30 years of experience in the field of rehabilitation counseling and psychology. She is the founder of Neurofeedback Clinics in Southern California. She works with children and adults to reduce or eliminate conditions of ADHD, anxiety, anger, depression, chronic pain, learning problems, and trauma. She's also the author of the book Solving the ADHD Riddle. And she is here to talk about her book, to talk about what she does, how she helps people, and to share with us some principles that can benefit us all as we focus on how well our brains are working. So definitely a huge part of health, right? The health of our brain, our mental health, and Dr. Connie McReynolds focuses on that day in, day out. I know you're going to enjoy what she has to share, and you'll benefit from it just as I did. Here's my interview with Dr. Connie McReynolds. I really uh, started out two or three decades ago in the field of rehabilitation counseling, but I think the core of where I come from is the fact that my mother taught second grade for 32 years in the same classroom. And I just, as I was writing the book, I started remembering a story about this little boy who couldn't read and what my mother needed to do to help him. And over the summer, she drove 45 miles each way to take him to a university teaching center to try and figure out why he couldn't learn how to read. And what they ended up diagnosing him with back then, which wasn't well known, is something now that's much better known, which was dyslexia. And so they actually had some strategies to figure out how to help him learn how to read. And as I was writing the book, that all just came flooding back. And I thought, my gosh, I think that was some kind of a core anchor somewhere in all of that. And I was a teacher for 25 years, only I did it in a university. And uh, as part of that university experience, when I moved to Southern California, I built an institute and they brought me out to build an assessment center and an institute at this university. And it just kind of evolved. A colleague one day came to me and said, you know, we're using this thing called neurofeedback in the school where children are struggling to learn how to read, which of course piqued my attention. Hmm. And he said, and we're having good success with it. And so I studied it. Uh, We opened it up for the community as a kind of a pilot project for a year. And this was 15 years ago. And we just started studying how it worked with children. And I studied how it worked with veterans. And we started getting calls. So the people who were coming in as volunteers for our program, uh, one mother, I remember specifically, came in and she said, you know, she said, he's been coming and we did all this. And I just don't think it really worked, she said, until I went to the family reunion this last weekend. And (laughs) everyone asked me, what I had done to my son because he seemed so different and was able to redirect himself. And she said, I think it was just so subtle that I didn't see it and everyone else could. And so it was working. Wow. And then we had one little boy who was about nine who came in one day. We'd been working with him for a while. His parents were walking him behind him and he's kind of long in the face. So it's, Oh, what's going on here? And he was kind of looking down, downtrodden. And he said, well, it's working. I can pay attention even when I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. poor guy. Oh, man. It was great. <laughs> Both of those stories just stuck. Created because a monster. <laughs> <laughs> 
so here it was. And then I really started paying attention to what we were figuring out. So the first five years, I really studied it for a while. And then after a while, I thought, I think we're onto something here. And then because I was an academic, I wanted to get some things out and publish it. So I spent two years searching the literature because I was just convinced someone else certainly somewhere would have had to have discovered this and written about it and figured this out. And there was nothing in the literature about this. And so I finally got that article out in 2018. And then I decided I wasn't really going to put the book out until I had a way to help people regardless of where they sat. Mm -hmm. And so once we solved that a couple of years ago, then I decided it's time to get this out and let people know what we've been able to accomplish here with this. All right. So you mentioned your book. Um, could you tell us about the book? Sure. <laughs> Love talking about the book. <laughs> and so the title is Solving the ADHD Riddle. And it's the real cause and lasting solution to your child's struggle to learn is the title of it. it's available on Amazon. And what I really wanted to do with this is to get the word out for what we've been able to accomplish in the clinics with parents and teachers and children and such and adults. And so a lot of adults come in struggling with conditions that get labeled a lot of different things. And so they may come in feeling anxious or stressed out, or maybe they're having panic attacks, or maybe they're you know having trauma responses. There can be a whole list of things. And it, regardless of what someone comes in the door with, I'm always going to run this assessment, which takes 20 minutes for me to look at these 37 areas of auditory and visual processing. And eight times out of 10, nine times out of 10, the people will have something going on that they will say, you know, I always wondered why it was so hard for me to do this or that, or why I seemed like I had to study twice as hard as someone else when I went through school, or why I just couldn't ever hang on to a job. I had an adult man in his 50s come one time, and uh, he was telling me that he was in jeopardy of losing yet another job. Mm. And I did the assessments, and the man didn't really have any auditory memory. So he wasn't able to hang on to what his boss was asking him to do. And it always looked like he wasn't paying attention or he was drifting off or just lackadaisical or other less kind words mm -hmm. uh, that get bountered around with children and adults. And so part of what's happening is that we're able to uncover this. We do it in 20 minutes. They get a 15 page report that's going to lay out all of this that's going on. And from that, then we build the training plan to be able to retrain the brain. And this is done through the process of neurofeedback. And this is all in the book. So I really chronicled um, all of this work in the book, and I broke it out into sections on auditory processing and visual processing and combined. I've also included information about the neurofeedback process, about brain waves, and why our brain can change, which is grounded in neuroplasticity. Uh, so all of that's in there, as well as some parent tips and teaching tips and a pilot project I did in a school and lots of references and resources as well. Nice. Um, now I have a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> I earlier used the word that you use the, the phrase or the word neurofeedback. Um, could you, could you briefly help, help me understand what it is? So neurofeedback is also called EEG biofeedback. And okay. so most people have heard of biofeedback which has been around for a very long time, where in the beginning, what we were doing is putting a, a clip-on sensor, perhaps on a finger, so that we could measure a pulse rate. And we were measuring respiration rates. And by seeing the biological feedback of your body on a computer screen or on a monitor, you could see your heart rate go up if you weren't breathing properly or you were stressed. Yeah. And you could also see through the use of breath work and relaxation, you could see and you could learn to train yourself that, oh, well, if I do this, if I relax, I'm going to slow down my heart rate. If I take a deeper breath, I can slow down my respiration, which means I feel calmer. And then I can train myself how to do this. And Be so that's the, breath, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you need to. <laughs> yes. Okay. So that's, so that's biofeedback. Uh -huh. I mean, I already have an idea now with neurofeedback, but I'll let you. Tell me yes. what 
So the neurofeedback is using a monitor sensors and a monitor to measure your brain waves. And so the fascinating thing is it's the same thing. We're not doing anything to you. Biofeedback doesn't do anything to you. You're just getting information. Neurofeedback, EEG biofeedback, same thing. Doesn't do anything to you. You're just getting information. So if we're trying to uh, affect attention, we can measure these brain waves and people can see based on the algorithm and you know the software system that's working, they can see, okay, wow, I thought I was relaxed, but this is flashing stress, <laughs> mm. tension. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people come in over the years, oh, I meditate, and we put them on there and they're through the roof with tension or stress. And they can't really know it necessarily. They can think they're doing all the right things and they can be trying to get there, but their life maybe hasn't really improved a whole lot. And then they can find their way to us and we get them on the equipment and that's flashing that this is saying, no, you have a lot of high tension. You're a lot of, you're carrying a lot of stress. And they'll say, well, that isn't, that is what I'm feeling. It's like, well, the equipment doesn't fabricate data. <laughs> this is your data. So here you are, <laughs> and if you want, we can really help you learn how to rewire this in your brain. And the beauty with the neurofeedback system is that once we get the brain literally rewired or strengthened in these areas of weakness, it tends to hold. So a person doesn't need to keep coming back to see me. We get them out the door, usually mm, 20 hours of brain training. Some need more, depending on where we're going, and some maybe a little bit less, but it's kind of ballpark it for people, but it really depends. Each person is different in how their brain responds to the intervention. It's also very dependent upon consistency. So those 30-minute sessions have to be twice a week or three times a week. We can't do less than two, and they have to be consistent. And this is where I tell people it's very much like going to the gym. If you want to build your muscles or you want to change anything in your life, it's all about repetition until you hardwire that into your brain, and that's what this is doing. And we tackle anxiety, we tackle all these auditory and visual processing problems, trauma, chronic pain, depression, anxiety, anger management, and the list goes on for what we can do because it's all has a similar theme, which is brain processing. Wow, that's, that's awesome. So what I didn't hear, hear you talk about was medication. Right. <laughs> I'm I'm curious because I I guess when you know and over the years even my first experiences with with ADHD I think when I was in school was that you know kids would need to take their medication or whatever so th this is this is very different in terms of mm -hmm. how we're, how we're treating it um, yes. could you talk about the the maybe the upside or downside to using medication as a, as an alternative. And I don't mean to so, put you on the spot. I, I, so, <laughs> I, yes, this is, this is a very important aspect of the work that I do <clears throat> because what I was discovering in the front end and it has held out through my career. First of all, diagnoses don't tell us anything necessarily about the person. They may give us a label to qualify for insurance or get us in the door for some kind of service. But um, early on in my career, literally 30 years ago, uh, it was, these don't tell me anything. I was a rehabilitation counselor. People came in with all sorts of diagnoses. And I would look at that and then just say, okay, that's what someone has diagnosed this person with, but I need to meet the person to find out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And I can have 10 children walk into my clinics on the same day all diagnosed with ADHD and all 10 children are going to look completely different and be organized completely differently. So the challenge is that yes, medications can dial down some of the symptoms. Okay. The allopathic world <laughs> is really driven towards symptom reduction. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, certainly if I break my arm, I want to reduce that symptom. Yeah. I want my arm to heal and I might need to be in a cast. The challenge with ADHD and a lot of these other conditions is that it doesn't get to the root of the problem. So we can think of it like a Band-Aid. It might keep some dirt out, you know, if we've got a cut, it might reduce some symptoms, but take away the medication and the symptoms generally return. 
And so parents were coming in initially, uh, having been down the road of medication, having been down the road of behavioral interventions, and nothing was working. Everything was as bad or worse than it had been when the meds wore off, children were having meltdowns at home, so they might get through school, the meds wear off, and then what are you going to do with all that pent up energy? Well, it's going to come out somewhere. And so I really started looking at this. It's like, there is something that's just not working here. What is going on? Behavioral interventions weren't helping. And then I had a whole set of parents who didn't want to go down that road at all, who were looking for something quite different. And so the challenge that happens with the medications for ADHD that I have found is that you may get rid of some of the symptoms as long as the child's taking it. You may end up with some side effects. You may have a child who's refusing to take it. You have a whole host of things going on. The bottom line, medications don't get rid of ADHD. They may dial down some symptoms. And perhaps in the school, if a child's getting kicked out of school every other day, you may need to go that route until you can figure out something else to do to literally get to the root cause. And that's what this does. Mm. So this assessment peels back across 37 areas of auditory and visual processing. And I can dial in on exactly what part of the brain is needing to be retrained. And so we set up a training plan for those findings that came out of the assessment. And by using the neurofeedback, the EEG biofeedback in a consistent manner, and then we test. So every 10 hours we come back and we run these same assessments because we're measuring for progress. So we have evidence-based data that tell us, okay, this is where we started. This is where we are after 10. We've made some progress. We still have some goals. We need another 10 to do that. We'll measure after every 10 hours of training. Nice. And that's the beauty of it. And I'm also listening for the stories for what's happening at school and at home, how the child's doing, how the parents are doing and how the teachers are doing, because it doesn't do much good. If a child can pass a test in my clinic and their life hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And so the key is, has this child's life changed? And that's what we're looking for. Gotcha. Wow. Um, I, in your I guess I'm cu I'm curious in your experience is ADHD is it the result of just changes in society is it usually trauma based I mean I guess it would be very difficult you said it's it's a it's very individual but uh, or is it just simply the hardware that we're we're getting at the start mm -hmm. what what are you finding or or oh, is I find all of that all of that and more uh, so each person's story uh, right now, I just did an intake on a little uh, boy. He's, uh, I think, nine. Well, he was born uh, testing positive to methamphetamines. Well, we've got a problem here with that one. So he's in the clinics. We're just starting with him. And that's going to be a journey for that little boy and for the parents, the adoptive parents. I've worked with adults in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. I've worked with children as young as three. Uh, the one thing I know is that there can be many causes for this. Certainly, I do think the uptick has something to do with perhaps uh, overexposure to technology, uh, overexposure to certain types of video games. I've written about that in the book as well, which is just let's have a cautionary tale here about some of these types of video games. We use video games, but they're what I call low impact types of video games, so they don't create a dopamine dump. That's a lot of these online or highly entertaining and very engaging <laughs> video games really cause dopamine dumps in the brain and that can cause addiction. And I've treated children for video game addiction that is just as serious as any other kind of addiction out there because of the consequences of it. Yeah. So the causal factor, we really can't peel it back too much. Um, we can say, yes, there are these pieces and these pieces for this particular person. But the bottom line, what I get to is like, you know, we can't go back and undo anything that caused it. Right. So all we can do is from today forward, what we can do is figure out where you are, where your child is. And then we can look at what strategies can we implement while you're doing neurofeedback and what can we do with the neurofeedback and see if we can't get to a different place and a different um, level of hope for this child to be able to succeed in school and adults. Yeah. I work with a lot of adults as well. Yeah. Uh, when, with adults, is it uh, typically that they've had um, symptoms from childhood or is there adult onset 
ADHD. I've never well before when I talk. Moment. Yeah, when I talk to people, I mean, certainly there can be traumatizing events that might create something. We can't ignore that because that mm -hmm. happens, and it does create difficulties for people. Uh, for a lot of people, what will happen is once we do this assessment, and I'm going over these assessment results. I had a man in his 50s weeping in my office when he said, finally, I understand why I've lost all these jobs mm. over the years. And so there used to be this myth um, <laughs> two or three decades ago where, oh, well, if your child has ADHD, they'll grow out of it when they get to adulthood. No, not so much. Okay. You might learn coping strategies. You might have to work twice as hard as the next person. Your brain might actually create some workarounds, which I could find when we run these assessments. <laughs> and so there are times that people's brains are very resourceful and have created all kinds of workarounds, but they're exhausted because of what it takes to try and get through their day versus what it's like after we get those areas strengthened and they have the full use of all the capacities and they're much better able now to demonstrate what they're capable of doing. And the, the kind of the tough part about all of this is with children who go through school, if they're struggling like this, it doesn't take very long for them to recognize that they're different from their peers. Maybe the teacher says something and their peers are able to just get right to it and just do whatever the teacher's asking and follow through. And they're sitting here and they're kind of looking around and they don't have any idea what it is they're supposed to do. And then they get in trouble for not paying attention. And then they start the very negative self-talk mm -hmm. and they always go in the same direction, which is I must not be very smart mm -hmm. or there is terrible words such as I'm, I'm really stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, and they start telling themselves that. And so we want to really get that stopped as fast as possible uh, because that goes nowhere fast. And we all know that that negative self-talk, once it gets ingrained, it takes some work to get rid of it. And I'd rather just not have it start at all. <laughs> if we can get to these children and figure out what's going on and get this remedy in place and get them going on their way, I think we have an opportunity to change their trajectory of their life, their family, the schools. I, I think we have the ability to change a lot of trajectory when even we help just one child uh, or one adult kind of get back and be able to do what they really want to do in life. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. I'm wondering, and just as I'm kind of mentally wrapping up, do, do you find that the training and the interventions would be able to help just about anybody, like to improve how their brain is focusing? Mm -hmm. Or is it very specific to those oh. who have a diagnosable disorder? It's so broad based. It's amazing. I've worked with athletes. I worked with a major league ball player. I worked with a gymnast who wanted to tune herself up before she went to a competition. And when she came back, she was wearing five medals. <laughs> so I have people who want to tune up their academic performance. And I just put a unit in a retirement center for senior citizens because about two years ago, we reversed the early onset of dementia in an 82 year old woman as independently confirmed by her physician who did not know she was coming to neurofeedback. Her son had brought her in saying, we think she has some memory problems. I did some testing and it's like, mm, yeah, we can strengthen some of this up. But I had no idea her physician had right before that run diagnostic on her. He didn't tell her, but he told her when she came in six months later, when he ran the test, he just looked at her and said, okay, what have you been doing? <laughs> wow. I've been doing neurofeedback. And he said, well, keep doing it because you just reversed this. I've been prepared to tell you that you've been entering into dementia. And now that's been reversed. Wow. Got a chill. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That yeah. is beautiful. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. When you think about the brain, it's neuroplasticity and we can change our brain at any time. Yeah. I love it. And I think that's, that's a huge, I mean, although we didn't talk a lot about it, I think that's a big message that comes with the work that you're doing is that we can change we can change this, we can change this brain of ours. So um, if someone's listening, what what would you tell them as far as the best way for them to benefit from your work? Mm -hmm. Well, online, I have a quick brief sum, uh, assessment that they can take. It's free. 
for that if they have some questions about auditory or visual. In the book, there's um, I go into greater detail with the checklist, and the book's available through audio and ebook, and also in print and paperback. And I did the audio book myself. Uh, you can also go to my website, which is www and my name Connie McReynolds, C O N N I E M C R E Y N O L D S dot com. <laughs> Thank my dad for that name. <laughs> and you can just peruse through my website. I've done a few podcasts myself that you can get on Spotify called Roadmap to the Brain. Uh, talking with some parents who went through and some people themselves who had gone through the neurofeedback uh, and just resources and other information about neurofeedback, some video clips that kind of help explain it a little bit and just research articles, but things I've published as well as the book is available on there to click through to Amazon. Okay, awesome. Well, that will be linked in the show notes for sure. Dr. Connie McReynolds, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. There it is. I want to thank Dr. McReynolds so much for being here on the show. And of course, as I mentioned, links are in the show notes to get access to her work and to her book via her website. So go and check that out. She shared it with us in the interview. The link is there waiting for you in the show notes, along with other resources for you. But one point that I want to just stop, just to slow down for a moment with you before I let you go to talk about from that interview is something that we didn't really spend a whole lot of time on, but it was implicit throughout the conversation with Dr. McReynolds. And that is our brain's ability to change itself. Absolutely unbelievable, right? As we think about it, as we learn about the um, capacity for neuroplasticity, the ability for our brain to, to change, to adapt, to shift, and to be trained like Dr. McReynolds does with her patients is absolutely out, outstanding. <laughs> it blows me away. And like I said, it's, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around it as we think about the, the concept of neuroplasticity. But what I want to leave you with is the fact that it is an undeniable fact. Neuroplasticity is an undeniable fact. That means that your brain has the ability to change itself. That means that you and I can't use the excuse, this is just the way I am. And kind of take that victim position and say, well, I can't do anything about it. That's just the way I am. And whatever challenges, difficulties that I have in, in the world or in getting things done or in getting the results that I want, well, I just am helpless. I can't really do anything about it. We can do something about it. And not only can we make changes in our lives, but we can make changes in our own brains, right? That is just, it, it, again, it blows me away. And I, I want it to have some impact on you too. We can change who we are. And Dr. McReynolds is helping people to change the way the brain, their brains work. And as a result, become even better versions of themselves. Isn't she? Isn't that exactly what she's doing if they can learn better? Think about their ability to focus, their ability to learn better. And of course, if you related to what she was talking about as a parent, with your children or for yourself, please get in touch with her. See what benefit she might have in order to help you continue to move forward. But for each and every one of us, it remains, the fact remains, our brains can change. We can change the way they work. We can develop habits. We can create habits. We can change our mindset. And when our mindset changes, everything else about us changes along with it. So let's get to work on it. Let's keep working on it. And I'm so happy that you are here with me working on it, doing the work, getting educated, growing, and learning 
and becoming a better version of yourself. You know, you are in the minority. As someone who is in this wild world, right, and trying to improve, trying to become a better version of yourself. You're in the minority, and I, I thank you for that. I celebrate you for that. I'm so happy that you're here with me. Like I mentioned, the link for Dr. McReynolds' site is in the show notes, as well as other resources, including our Facebook group. Um, one of my books is there for you to download for free. And of course, a link to our coaching program where we help apply some of the principles of neuroplasticity into fitness, into creating habits, into changing mindsets so that we can all approach this with the best chance, the best opportunities for success that we possibly could have. So again, I thank you. Thanks for being here with me. And if you wouldn't mind, this is, I have a feeling, going to be one of those episodes that is is popular. Um, a lot of times episodes like this end up being popular. So if there's someone that you know of, a parent, or someone in your network that you know of that could benefit from um, Dr. McReynolds' work and the message behind it, please share. Please share the podcast. Just hit the share button on your podcast player and send a text message with that link in it so that they can benefit from it as well and if you haven't done so already please follow the show in your podcast player and i will talk with you again soon here on the begin within health show